Honorable Minister Sri Jairam Ramesh, Professor Mahendra Dev, Professor Jairam Jaymon Pandit, Professor Subrata Sarkar, and the entire IGAT community. First of all, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank Minister Jairam Ramesh for a very thoughtful and thought provoking uh, address and this convocation. <coughs> Second, I want to congratulate all the students who got various degrees today. Uh, you a matter of pride to yourselves, to your families, and most importantly, to this institution. The director also told me that you all got jobs and that the placement record is about 150%, so that is a testimonial uh, to the quality of uh, education at IGITR and the brand equity of this institution. As I see students in front of me, I am always reminded of my own college days and my own graduation. You might well ask when did that happen? That happened in the dark ages. Uh, if you take uh, the time axis, time T0 and time T now, T0 is the discovery of fire and T now is the discovery of the iPad, I'm somewhere in between. <laughs> Nevertheless, when I see students, I can't resist the temptation of uh, giving advice. So the advice or counsel that I want to give you today is about using your judgment. In his introductory remar remarks, director called attention to some comments I made earlier at this forum about how economists graduating and going into the real world will have to use their judgment over the textbook knowledge that they have learned in the institution here. It's all very good. You're all academically equipped. I also know that you do a lot of case studies relating to the real world outside. But doing case studies in the environs of IGITR is quite different from actually going out into the real world and applying what you've learned. I want to put that in the context of some of the judgment issues that we in the Reserve Bank have to confront. Even you, as students, have the analytical capability of preparing the platform on which a decision has to be made. But ultimately, a decision involves, after all the analysis, after all the discussion, after all the consultation, deployment of judgment. I will give you two examples of uh, where we have to use judgment in recent times in formulating a monetary policy. If you take the macroeconomic context today, we find that growth has moderated. Inflation has come off from the peak, but even at 7 plus percent, it's still high. Investment has not only decelerated, but it actually declined. And the external sector is very vulnerable. That's the macroeconomic context in which we have be formulating a monetary policy. Two dilemmas that I want to present to you where we have to use judgment. The first is on balancing between growth and inflation. If you look at the growth numbers, Dr. Jairam Ramesh had given the long-term perspective, but if you take just the post-crisis years, Last year, growth was 6.2%. We've all beaten our chests about how low it is, the lowest in nine years. It's not only low compared to the pre-crisis years, it's also low compared to the immediate post-crisis years. Growth this year, we all were dismayed by the number that this, uh, the CSO put out two days ago. That is going to be about 5%, which will be the lowest in the last decade. Why is growth slowed? 
growth has slowed because consumption has fallen, net exports have fallen, and most importantly, investment has declined. That is a matter of great concern because today's investment is tomorrow's production capacity. So if investment is not taking place today, our growth potential on the way forward is going to be hurt. If you look at inflation, inflation was 10 plus percent in 2010. In 2011-12, it has come down. The latest number is 7.2 percent. As I said a short while ago, that is uh, a decline from the peak, but still about the comfort level. And there's several structural, cyclical factors driving that inflation. There's food, food inflation. There's food inflation driven by cyclical factors. There's food inflation driven by structural factors. The structural factor, as many of you have heard us say, many of you understand yourselves, is that as income levels have gone up in rural areas, people's food habits are changing, they're eating more of protein, therefore there is protein food inflation. That's the structural factor driving food inflation. Then there is the oil prices. Because we import 80% of our oil requirement, and because we buy it in dollars but have to convert that to rupees when we sell, the rupee is depreciated. There is inflation coming from oil prices. There is inflation also coming from the high fiscal deficit that the government is running. And finally, there is inflation coming from demand pressures across the country. In a country with a per capita income of less than $1,500, if incomes go up, that's going to result almost immediately in increasing consumption because the marginal propensity to consume at that income level is high. So the Reserve Bank tightened its monetary policy all through 2010-11, but since 2012 we've been easing our policy. One question we've always faced over the last one year is how do we balance between declining growth and stubborn inflation. Declining growth demands that the Reserve Bank ease and reduce interest rates. But stubborn inflation requires that we keep interest rates high. So how do we calibrate that balance? Where do we calibrate the interest rate? That's been a constant struggle in the Reserve Bank. And several paradoxes we face, such as the paradoxes that uh, Minister Ramesh had pointed out to you in the HDA context. One of the paradoxes in the growth inflation balance is if growth has decelerated, why is inflation still high? If you look at our peer countries, other emerging economies, their growth rates have also come down. But their inflation too has come down. But we are having decelerating growth, but persistent inflation. What's the cause for this? There's several hypotheses put forward about this, how, about why India is contrarian on this growth inflation balance. It could be our supply constraints, especially in infrastructure, sectoral imbalances in demand and supply. It could be the high fiscal deficit because many of our peer countries don't have fiscal deficit at all, or they have very small deficits. It could be the larger depreciation of the rupee. It could be the wage inflation unrelated to productivity improvement. So we need to investigate all this, but we need to understand why India is unique among countries of its size and peer group in terms of growth inflation balance. People have criticized the Reserve Bank, saying that uh, we've not managed to bring inflation down, but we managed to, or we have only ended up making growth low. 
we have several arguments in the Reserve Bank against that criticism and I will not go into all of that here. But I do want to tell you that it's a balance, it's a criticism that we are sensitive to and it's a balance between growth and inflation that we struggle with. People who are worried about declining growth are typically quite articulate. They have, they have a platform to can express their concerns. I have sympathy with that view. I'm not saying that's an invalid criticism, but I just want to say that uh, their voice is heard. People are hurt by inflation, the large majority of the poor. Their voice is not heard. So it's important for the government, for public institutions such as, such as the Reserve Bank, and also for all of you graduating students, regardless of where you're working, that you not only pay attention to what comes your way, but also go out of your way to find out what is important in making decisions. So that's the first dilemma between growth and inflation that I want to talk about. The second dilemma that I want to talk about is about managing the external sector. Today, the external sector is vulnerable. <coughs> Last year, the current account deficit was 4.2% of GDP. This year, 2012-13, we expect that the current account deficit is going to be significantly higher than that. So it's going to be historically the highest current account deficit measured as a proportion of GDP. That again is uh, somewhat of uh, a paradox if you look at it from the textbook economics because the rupee has depreciated by about 20% in the last two years. You would expect that rupee depreciation would be a natural uh, counterforce to current account increasing. But we have the rupee depreciate by about 20%, but still high current account deficit. That's happening because in the short term, our exporters are not able to take advantage of our depreciating rupee. But on the other hand, our imports are inelastic. We import about $140 billion of oil and that is distributed or subsidized by the government. So the demand response to a high international price is not showing up in the real economy. Imports are inelastic, imports are going up, exports are coming down, therefore our current account deficit is increasing. There are three concerns about the current account deficit. The first is the level of CAD. The second is the quality of our current account deficit. We would not worry so much if the current account deficit is so high. We would worry, of course, if it's high, but we would not worry so much if the current account deficit is on account of import of capital goods. But here we're having a current account deficit because of import of oil, because of import of gold. And the third concern about the CAD, apart from its quantum, apart from its quality, is the way we are financing it. We are financing our current account deficit through increasingly volatile flows. Instead, we should ideally be getting as much of foreign direct investment as possible to finance the CAD. On the other hand, we are getting a lot of volatile flows to finance it. The dilemma we faced in making a monetary policy in the context of the current account deficit is people have asked us when we did the reduction in policy rates on January 29, that how come you reduced rates at a time when you yourself are saying that the current account deficit is going to go up? How do you justify this? Because you would expect that if the current account deficit is going to go up, the central bank would actually 
keep a tight policy. On the other hand, the Reserve Bank <coughs> went and eased it. So we had to explain saying that we had several variables going into our policy calculus, our growth, inflation, current account deficit. We had to explain by way of uh, how lower interest rates may not necessarily aggravate aggregate demand. But these are all inferences or arguments made on the basis of some analysis but largely made on the basis of judgment. So that again calls into question the judgment that you employ to make decisions, especially if those decisions are concerning you know, the larger national economy. So that's all I want to say by way of what counsel advice I have to give you, which is that you're all very good students, you've learned a lot. You've learned a lot of what's happening outside your college through case studies, but when you actually go and work, you will encounter situations where you will have to go beyond your textbook knowledge. I know you will do all that. I wish you all the very best. Once again, I want to thank uh, Minister J. Ram Ramesh for uh, giving us a very thoughtful uh, convocation address. All the very best.